Welcome everybody. Uh, it is a great pleasure for uh, me, for us, for Hanok and me, the International Economic Law and Policy Working Group in Birmingham Law School to resume our activities in 2022 and to resume uh, with such an interesting uh, panel of speakers and such an interesting topic. So today we are uh, uh, welcoming uh, uh, Ms. Anoush Der Bogosian. Uh, she serves at the WTO, a very distinguished uh, background. Uh, she's, I'm reading from her bio, the WTO Gender Policy uh, Advisor and the head of the WTO Trade and Gender uh, Unit. And she was appointed already in 2017 by the former Director General Roberto Azevedo as the WTO's first uh, trade and gender expert. So she, there is a lot of uh, expertise here uh, linked to the uh, real world over the practice. And she's joined by uh, uh, Dr. Amrita Bari, Associate Professor, currently Associate Professor of International Trade Law at the Instituto Tecnologico Autonomo de Mexico. Um, and she's also co-chair, uh, professor for WTO uh, in the WTO chair program uh, for uh, Mexico. And um, uh, I also like to, to mention that she's a former uh, colleague uh, uh, at Birmingham Law School, and she was also a, a very good and excellent PhD student, and her PhD was upgraded into a great uh, seminal uh, monograph uh, uh, published by Edward uh, Algar. Um, we will also have with us tonight uh, Dr. Loblin uh, Bular, uh, a colleague of Birmingham Law School. Uh, she's an expert of international and national environmental law, but with many intersections, including also uh, gender uh, issues. So what I do suggest is that we start uh, without further ado, with the presentation and then we will have a few comments from uh, Loveline. Up to you, please. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Luca, um, for, this, uh, for this introduction. And um, I'm very happy to be, uh, to be here to present uh, the paper we did with, with Amrita um, at, this, uh, at this event. Um, I will uh, I will start with the um, with kind of setting the scene a little bit to um, to understand um, how COVID nineteen has impacted uh, women entrepreneurs specifically. We are you know the paper is really looking at uh, this uh, this angle, and uh, Amrita will uh, will then go on explaining how uh, trade agreements and, and trade policy can really uh, support women. Um, that are that have been uh, impacted by this uh, by this pandemic. So this is kind of the two two way uh, that we want to um, to uh, to present the paper. So um, I will I will start with um, with let's say setting the scene, understanding how COVID nineteen has impacted um, women entrepreneurs. Uh, and um, I would like to say that uh, compared to to men, really women have been impacted the most. Uh, by by the pandemic, uh, if we look at um, recent figures, we see that they've lost almost 800 billion US dollars in income uh, in uh, in 2020. Uh, globally, they've lost uh, more than 64 million jobs um, last year. Uh, it's a five percent loss compared to men, um, where uh, it's a 3.9 percent loss. So, um, and that's kind of a global picture, but if we look at women entrepreneurs, actually women entrepreneurs have been hit um, the hardest as well. Uh, first, because uh, their business uh, is smaller than those of male entrepreneurs. So um, uh, the smaller businesses are, uh, the more vulnerable they are to crisis. So we've seen that during you know, various crises, whether they are environmental crisis or financial crisis. Today with the pandemic, we see that basically women are, are caught within this, this negative loop 
where uh, their small size uh, prevents them from accessing finance, for example, or, or trade opportunities, which then prevents them from uh, diversifying and growing, and hence they remain small and vulnerable. So that's kind of a first, a first uh, point which this pandemic has really has uh, uh, shown um, even more than, than before. The second point I want to, to, to focus on is how the crisis has really exacerbated um, the barriers that women entrepreneurs already face. And one in particular I'm going to focus on is uh, access to finance. And um, if we look at um, uh, this issue of access to finance, this issue has been identified by women entrepreneurs as being a key trade and business uh, development barrier, actually. And there is a lot of evidence showing that uh, women entrepreneurs um, face higher difficulties or higher obstacles in, in accessing um, such uh, financial opportunities uh, for various reasons. Um, uh, examples of reasons would be for, uh, that they don't have collaterals, for example, to show to financial institutions, um, unlike men do. And so, Basically, uh, this barrier has been worsened by uh, this, uh, this, this pandemic. And um, as a result, I would say that women entrepreneurs have suffered a triple uh, financial shock um, with, I would say, uh, three impact waves. So the first impact wave, um, I would call it the fund freeze. Actually, I'm, it's not me calling it. It's the women entrepreneurs themselves calling it the fund freeze. Um, they are facing this, this freeze, that is to say they have a, a shortage in the, the cash uh, cycle due to loss of sales, uh, lack of customers, um, the restrictions in the supply chain. They've also spent all their savings uh, trying to, to, to keep their, their business at, at, um, at float. So um, this, fund free, this fund freeze sorry, has been worsened by the fact that also women um, entrepreneurs were not able to access uh, the financial recovery packages designed by governments. They were in fact, um, how can I say, uh, de facto excluded uh, from government packages uh, because actually the responses um, are not adapted to women's specific needs and situation. Um, if we look at the global picture and uh, we can see that only 9% of all the recovery measures taken um, to support women's, um, uh, to support women focus on economic and financial security, only 9%. So it's, it's, we can see that it's very, it's quite, uh, it's quite low. And um, basically um, the, the support schemes have not taken women's entrepreneurs specific situation, as I was saying. I will just give you a few examples. So for example, um, some of these schemes target um, larger uh, small businesses or company with formal employees uh, with uh, office locations, for example. Often we know that women entrepreneurs are uh, self-employed or um, they, they work from home. So um, the idea of, of uh, have, you know, conditioning uh, financial support uh, by having a certain number of employees uh, really um, does not support women entrepreneurs. Another example is that uh, these sort of programs just simply provided options for continuing existing loans. Actually, we see um, that women entrepreneurs don't go through uh, the traditional financial uh, institutions to get their businesses running. They don't have, uh, often they don't have loans, they turn to family, they turn to, to, to their close friends, but often they don't have uh, the opportunity that, uh, you know, banks can, can, can give to, uh, to other men, uh, to other, um, other entrepreneurs, especially male uh, entrepreneurs. So this is something which, which we, we, we've seen um, throughout, uh, throughout the, the, you know, the different countries that this has not been focusing so much on how women entrepreneurs really uh, function and how the businesses function. Um, also some opportunities created by these schemes uh, were not accessible to women because they were competing directly with uh, male entrepreneurs that have higher, um, I mean, 
not higher, but uh, bigger companies or that are stronger financially. So basically all these opportunities were not um, reachable for, for them. So that's kind of this, the first impact wave. The second impact wave, I would say it's business closures. It's kind of an obvious thing. You don't have the cash, you don't have access to finance, you don't have uh, customers, you are bound to close your, your businesses. And actually, um, this, um, this is something which, which um, we can see uh, from also because um, where, you know, we, we can see this because uh, also women entrepreneurs work in, in, in sectors that have been uh, hit the hardest by uh, the pandemic. Uh, I can give you examples, uh, uh, got a lot of figures in the tourism sector, for example, we know that uh, the tourism sector employs 50%, uh, 54% uh, 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 of, of women uh, in the industry work there. But, um, and that includes workers and entrepreneurs. Uh, we have, for example, in Latin America, uh, women manage more than 50% of uh, tourism businesses, for example. So we have, we, we see, we've, we've seen the evidence. And of course, with the border closing and the tourists not uh, traveling, then these businesses, of course, will uh, have, um, have, um, have completely closed. Um, so this has um, also, we can see uh, these business closures. We can explain this also by the fact that women owned uh, companies um, um, work uh, more in the services sector and they are more, um, you know, in terms of um, their types of businesses deals more with face-to-face uh, -face customers more than uh, than male uh, entrepreneurs so this is also you know when you don't have when you have confinements and you have uh, you know uh, bans restrictions then obviously the customers they don't go to the to the businesses so that's the second impact wave the third impact wave is i would say it's it's a spillover effect on on the household and uh, female employees in fact, as a result of losing their businesses, uh, many women entrepreneurs have lost their means of income and subsistence. And most of them um, actually are um, engaged as sole owners. They have only one business at a time. So basically losing their business means losing their income, 100% of their income. Um, uh, it means also that um, a lot of women employ uh, many other women. We've seen that in, in, uh, in some of the surveys that uh, the WTO has conducted at the regional level, um, we see that um, women tend to employ more, uh, more uh, female workers than male workers. And of course, you know, if they lose their business, these, these women also uh, lost their jobs, lose their jobs. So this is also has this sort of um, uh, impact uh, on uh, on employee and uh, their income as well. I think uh, you know this. Um, if look, if we look at the trade aspect, you know, we we can see that basically this financial shock or these financial shocks or waves really prevent women entrepreneurs from from trading. Um, and um, I will conclude by looking at. Um, what could be the next, the future of, of, of trade, uh, or is actually um, already, um, it's, uh, it's uh, e-commerce. And we see now that e-commerce is on the rise. We see a lot of women entrepreneurs, actually the, the, the messages I get from them often is to say, you know, I want to go digital. I want to, to use e-commerce to be able to, to sell my products. They've been going online, um, I would say almost by force to be able to still be uh, active uh, uh, in their businesses. And we've seen the trend is, is really, really, uh, really accelerating um, to the point that we have some uh, regional organizations like, for example, UNSCAP that have been devising specific um, programs, training programs for women entrepreneurs to be able to use e-commerce as, as a as a, as, a, as a tool to be able to, 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 to sell their products, not just uh, at the national level, but also internationally. 
Um, so, but you know, this, you know, I have to say that this uh, digital transformation of entrepreneurs is not that easy. You always often hear some, um, some speeches here and there saying, oh, e-commerce is the solution that will help women entrepreneurs uh, you know, uh, access these, these markets. Well, it's not, it's not that easy. Uh, it has a cost attached to it as well. It's not so, uh, you, you will have to be, you know, women entrepreneurs would need to be also um, prepared in terms of knowledge of the, 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 the digital transformation that they're going to go through. Uh, in terms of, of equipment. Often when they have access to equipment, uh, it's outdated equipment. So this being, there is still a persisting uh, gender digital divide globally uh, that has actually in the last few years that has widened. And so um, just to, um, to conclude on, on, on this point, um, I just want to say that uh, these considerations need to be taken on board by, uh, I would say, governments when they 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 uh, they draft their their policies or their different programs uh, to be able to really um, address these needs that women have. It's not just to say we're going to do e-commerce for women. It's just how going to how are you going to support them from A to Z because they don't have all the the means and all the knowledge that uh, needs to be. Um, um, that they need to have in order to, to make e-commerce work for them. And so talking about, um, uh, talking about policy and, and solutions, um, I will give the floor now to, to Amrita that will uh, explain to you how um, the current uh, trade agreements can support women and also uh, some examples of, of trade policy. So Amrita, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Anoush. Um... I will now focus on uh, two different questions, um, uh, both relating to policy prescriptions, uh, as Anoush mentioned. Uh, so I'll first talk about how existing FTAs, how existing trade agreements can help. And second, um, what more needs to be done to ensure that these trade policy instruments can help in protecting women's business interests. In other words, what remains missing in the existing trade agreements in this respect. So how can FTAs help? Trade agreements can play an important role in enhancing women's empowerment uh, because they can be used as negotiating instruments to incentivize changes at the domestic level in there as well as in, um, in, in the other countries, in, in uh, domestic level in, 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 in their country as well as in the other countries. Two reasons in particular uh, sort of support our claim here. First, the existing and future trade agreements can increase trade flows and uh, therefore lead to more business opportunities and a better standard of life for all, including women. And second, through trade deals, countries can encourage trade partners to reduce their trade barriers and create business conducive environment for women entrepreneurs. So, what we have done in our paper is after having talked about the challenges, the barriers in the first part, in the second part, we examine these provisions in existing trade agreements that can help um, women overcome the barriers that impede their business potential and protect or expand their market access. So to give you a background, as we speak of all trade agreements in force, um, some 400 plus trade agreements in force today, uh, little more than 20% of them have an explicit commitment on gender, at least one provision on gender. And of course, we can expect many more future agreements to accommodate these concerns as gender mainstreaming um, as a trend is gaining uh, a lot of traction um, in the past few years. Um, however, a good majority of these agreements have not included provisions that directly seek to uphold or expand business interests. Most of these existing commitments we find in the trade agreements um, that are explicitly related to gender or to women's interest, um, mostly treat women as labor, social actors, or mothers as they focus on education, women's employment, 
labor standards, equality, physical safety and healthcare concerns and maternity needs and childcare rights. Yet there are very few agreements uh, and these provisions in these existing agreements that can help in precisely reducing the barriers that, uh, that Anush um, has uh, just mentioned. So in our paper, we divide these best practice provisions, these best practice examples uh, that relate to the concern um, under five different types of provisions. But for the interest of time, uh, let me just try and discuss two of these provisions. So the first kind are reservations that can allow countries to employ women favoring measures such as favorable procurement schemes and subsidies. Anush mentioned how COVID-19 relief packages are excluding women-owned businesses from their list of beneficiaries. So going forward, countries may consider offering various support schemes to small businesses that can particularly impact women businesses in the shape of state aid, bailouts, loans, or subsidies, or even women favoring government procurement measures. But the question is, are these measures even legally consistent? Well, in several existing agreements, Countries have reserved the right to engage in measures that could otherwise be inconsistent with their obligations under crisis-like situations. For example, in South Korea, Singapore trade agreement, parties reserve with them the right to regulate and provide financial benefits to small businesses owned by women that may need such reliefs during uh, this pandemic or during future crises that we might face in the years to come. Now, the second type of provisions are focused on enhancing women's access to finance and other productive resources. As Anush mentioned, lack of access to finance is one of the key barriers that can impede women's participation in trade. Um, and this barrier is very much acknowledged in several FTAs. Take for instance, Canada-Israel trade agreement that was, that was modernized in 2017. In that agreement, parties seek to cooperate on uh, on several things, um, but one of one of those list of promises include uh, uh, cooperation on promoting financial inclusion for women in these respective jurisdictions through financial uh, through provision of financial training, increase in access to finance and financial assistance. And in other agreements, parties seek to encourage the flow of information among uh, women's businesses. And this is again a favorable provision as trade information is a precondition to empowering small businesses as information about markets, procedures, taxes is, is critical for businesses to make economically sound decisions in light of market realities. Um, so moving to the second question, um, right. So all these examples show to us that many milestones have already been achieved in respect of making trade agreements and trade policy instruments work for enhancing women's empowerment, but then uh, a lot more remains to be done. So what's missing? What remains missing? What more is needed to make these provisions work, right? We already have mainstreamed these gender provisions in more than 20% of our existing trade agreements. So what next? How Are they working? If they are not working, what can we do? Well, mainly, um, I would like to discuss um, three major shortcomings in the existing gender provisions. Um, first, they're all about promises. Second, mostly, well, I would say all of them, with very few exceptions, are completely not enforceable. So they cannot be enforced. And second, um, these wonderful gender provisions have been added so far by countries in their trade agreements without any attempt to define what gender equality or what gender means, uh, or um, to define the scope of women's empowerment, gender equality, or these kinds of terms. So the first, uh, moving on to the first uh, shortcoming, right? Almost all gender provisions with um, with very few exceptions um, in in certain East African countries agreements, uh, these exceptions are found because they have um, signed, they have negotiated some binding provisions, legally binding provisions. Um, almost all gender provisions included in the existing agreements are drafted with soft permissive grammatical construction. 
may, could, can, endeavor, seek, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the countries have undertaken these commitments in a rather modest and non-binding manner, right? Um, and they have generally left the implementation of these activities um, uh, to their available resources and uh, political willingness. Second, um, most of these agreements cannot be, and, and these provisions, most of these provisions um, cannot be enforced because they are drafted in the form of cooperation provisions. Um, they cannot be enforced first because of the way they are drafted and second, even if they're drafted as legally binding obligations, um, in most of the agreements that include such provisions, um, these provisions have been excluded from the agreement's dispute settlement mechanism. And we understand that there are no rights without remedy. And most of these agreements do not uh, even provide for any institution or procedure to implement these commitments. So without implementation, without enforcement mechanisms, it is difficult to see how these agreements might actually work to improve the lives of women. And finally, uh, the terms, um, these concepts, gender equality, or even gender, women empowerment, um, they have not been defined in any multilateral or regional trade agreement so far. And to date, there is no universally accepted definition as such of gender equality or empowerment of women. Um, and this is not the first time we are witnessing uh, the issue of lack of definition for important concepts or terms used in trade policy instruments, public morality, national security. I mean, there are just two examples uh, that have already shown how such escape windows can be used um, as tools of protectionism. So the broad and undefined scope of gender equality can likewise allow countries to disguise an illegal uh, protectionist measure as a policy objective. Here, the principal concern mainly in developing countries is uh, and mainly in developing countries that are negotiating a trade agreement with developed countries, is the extent to which such a provision can allow countries to stretch the scope of this provision beyond gender equality concerns. Uh, so if country A justifies a measure that bans or restricts trade with country B because country B ranks poorly on global gender gap report, or because it does not comply with its obligations or commitments under the ILO conventions. Um, country B can see this as country A's attempt to impose its own standards on country B. Um, this shows how an attempt to address gender equality concern in a trade policy instrument, such as a trade agreement, may actually be seen as an attempt by another country to engage in cultural imperialism. Um, and, and how it can be seen by other countries um, as being used uh, by mainly by the developed countries to take advantage of unequal market power that they have over their trading partner or to diminish other countries' comparative advantage in a certain industry or a certain product, especially because the term uh, gender equality um, in these provisions are used without a precise definition or a defined scope. So what more is needed? Well, a lot more. Collection of sex disaggregated data, awareness, expertise on trade and gender issues, political will to use trade policies in this respect. They're all important, but it is equally important to make the current gender provisions enforceable and, 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 and to draft them with a defined scope. So they can go beyond um, just being Cinderella provisions. Um, I'll probably stop here and, uh, and wait for the questions and comments. Many thanks indeed. Uh, it's, it's a very rich presentation and it is giving a lot of food for thought, but for now, I already have a couple of questions, but for now we'll, I will leave it to Lovelene uh, to, to give her, her comments. But thanks, Luca, uh, and thanks, Anush and Amrita, for that paper uh, and that presentation. Uh, I really enjoyed reading your paper, and the title itself was uh, very provocative and, and really interesting. And I suppose 
um, because I had the pleasure of reading the draft paper, uh, I really liked the way you compared the experience uh, right at the outset of cocoa farmers and trade agreements and looking at you know, women entrepreneurs. Um, but I also appreciate the fact that the paper itself the title talks about entrepreneurs. So I think the first question that comes to mind is what is a woman entrepreneur? Um, because that in itself, uh, uh, you know, picking up on Amrita's point about definitional uncertainty, that in itself is, uh, uh, is, a, is a term which has many meanings, uh, uh, which allows people to use it in different ways in different sorts of agreements. So I'd be really interested when we get to it to hear your sort of thoughts on how, how you kind of approach that. I had a few structural points as well, but uh, I think what I want to say at the outset is uh, it's a point that Amrita was making just now about uh, how through regional or bilateral trade accords, countries can encourage their trade partners to reduce trade barriers and create conducive environment for women entrepreneurs. And it made me think about uh, the importance of kind of looking at, well, the origin of the goods or the services. And by origin, I mean the country of origin uh, and, and what that says about the bargaining power of that particular country in that negotiation process. And I suppose that might have something then to do with the extent to which gender responsive or gender mainstreaming provisions might be uh, brought into the agreement. Um, I say that also because uh, when I see the title of your paper and I see the word chocolate, I'm thinking about cocoa um, and, and the countries where cocoa grows, uh, and the kind of trade agreements that those countries might be entering into and what might be their negotiating power there. And I think it becomes important to look at the country of origin, the good or service that we're talking about, well, the actors involved, as you both very rightly pointed out, whether it's women, men, et cetera. Uh, but uh, so all of these things, I think, really kind of complicate the waters when we are looking at this uh, question of uh, gender responsiveness or gender mainstreaming. I mean, I must say that uh, in the draft paper, you mentioned how you're drawing on the semi-structured interviews and questionnaire surveys. And I thought that was fascinating, uh, you know, the, 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 the detail that it provides in the first section of your paper. I, I really, really enjoyed reading that. And I wonder whether you might want to make that even more explicit in that first section that you are drawing on this kind of rich resource of interviews uh, and surveys in your paper. Um, I just want to pick up a point that Amrita was just highlighting. Uh, it's talking about best practice examples and um, gender explicit provisions. And I think she very rightly points out that these provisions can be found in different parts of these agreements. You know, they come in the preamble. There's a reference to goal five of the sustainable development goals. You talk about CEDAW. So, you know, tick, tick, tick. There's gender for you. And that doesn't really take us uh, uh, very far in terms of gender responsiveness or gender mainstreaming. So I'd be really interested to hear what you understand gender responsiveness and gender mainstreaming to be, because there, there, there's obviously, as you both kind of uh, hinted at, uh, the problem that these provisions are being included. And uh, to me, uh, as I work in the environmental sector, it's very similar to that situation where you include that one environmental provision and then sort of forget about it. So how do we how do we build on this kind of limitation that Amrita was just highlighting, which still provides us with a good starting point to start you know, ensuring that gender has a stronger place in these uh, trade agreements. Um, in, in your paper, I, I really liked your kind of discussion of the barriers that women entrepreneurs have faced in the pre-COVID-19 period and then kind of contrasting it or rather building on it or exacerbated during the COVID-19 period. And this again kind of for me is an interesting comparison with environment because when COVID-19 started, everybody was talking about this pre-COVID environmental situation. And then how at the beginning of the crisis, it was going to be a turning point for the environment uh, while forgetting that you know, there is a pre, middle and post COVID sort of environment. So I wonder to what extent you feel that these kind of measures that you suggest or you, you believe already there in some of the FTAs, what is kind of the sustainability and the longevity of these measures? Because again, as Amrita pointed out, um, we are unfortunately living in a world where we acknowledge the, the potential for new crises emerging, you know, new epidemics, pandemics, or other problems. 
So how do we crisis proof ourselves from a gender and trade perspective? Uh, and uh, from that perspective, of course, is a real danger in looking at gender responsive provisions as a box ticking exercise. So I suppose that could be another thing uh, to consider. Um, because I just want to push you a little bit because your paper kind of talked about cocoa farmers, women as cocoa farmers at the beginning, um, whether it might be interesting to kind of bring that into the conversation a bit, because uh, uh, although you didn't mention it in the presentation, your paper does talk about agriculture uh, and the fact that much of women's role in agriculture is either in the informal agriculture economy or the semi-formal agriculture economy. And linked to the point that Anush was making at the beginning about uh, uh, how companies with formal employees or companies with formal status are the ones that get absorbed into the trade sector and might be uh, promoted even at the domestic level to engage in these international trade conversations. I wonder where then the role of the women farmers and women entrepreneurs who, for example, participate in commodities markets, particularly in developing countries, how, how, how does that relationship then play out from a gender and international trade perspective would be another thing I'd like to hear more about. Um, because you talk about um, the digital divide, Anush mentioned the digital divide, I was also wondering whether it could be useful to speak of uh, some of the draft agreements. I understand there is a draft UK Australia FTA which, for example, talks about well, talks about gender and digital sort of issues, sort of in the same provision, and and I appreciate that section two of your paper is focusing on existing trade agreements, but I wonder whether there's also room to speculate a bit on some of those new directions because it, it does provide an opportunity to recognize intersections rather than sort of putting you know gender and digital in these sort of clear uh, silos. Um, as I was just saying, I mean, and I think it's a point that was well made by Amrita as well, that um, clearly there are, there are shortcomings, there are limitations with existing trade agreements, but I think it's important to acknowledge that it, it is a very useful starting point. We are definitely, we are, we are moving forward. It's just, we need to figure out how to keep this sort of momentum and actually expand on it quite rapidly. Um, so this is question of how do we get this gender language into trade agreements um, and I think here it's kind of also maybe important to think about how do you get um, recognition in design and implementation of trade agreements. And I think that's uh, uh, a dimension uh, Amrita was talking about the absence of uh, being subjected to dispute settlement mechanisms. So, so how do we make this truly more gender responsive from a design perspective and also an implementation perspective? And also in addition to these trade partners, in addition to countries, uh, or expecting countries to promote the introduction of gender responsive provisions, what are the other nudge points? Uh, you know, we talked about the Trade and Gender Committee. Uh, you know, there are uh, other organizations who might be uh, interested in, say, Goal 5, the Sustainable Development Goals. How do we engage with these different nudge points to improve the gender responsiveness of the new trade agreements uh, that uh, are in play right now? Um, I also think it's important perhaps to acknowledge the importance of domestic trade law and policy uh, because we, we are we're putting a lot of sort of uh, hope that the domestic government will want to negotiate, uh, you know, gender responsive language. And we know that in many countries that itself is a deeply problematic issue. So uh, how do we, how do we uh, expect or get countries in sort of a COVID recovery space to acknowledge you know, the gender specific aspects and, and kind of push for it, I think uh, might be another important point. I liked how in your paper, you kind of very clearly identify sort of the bottom up versus the or bottom up and top down approaches to this issue. And I, I, I wonder whether there is room actually to see where they might marry up because that, that is essential in order for these uh, FTAs to have more responsive policies, not just in terms of their presence in the agreements, but also how they're actually uh, actioned by governments. Um, 
And the final point, and I think um, Amrita again um, um, mentioned it, was kind of how having such provisions in agreements might play out in the universe of you know, international trade law, whether we look at procurement provisions, because you refer to government procurement uh, as one of the mechanisms that could be used to promote gender responsive provisions, also uh, the agreement on services and the agreement on trade. Um, so there is kind of this dimension of uh, how with an increase, potential increase in the use of such provisions, there is a danger of it being used as a protectionist measures. I mean, it's a fate that environmental and climate change measures have faced, uh, and that perhaps is something else to consider. And finally, because uh, you mentioned that there were certain agreements, for example, those coming out of East Africa that had particularly sort of useful provisions, I wonder whether there is any room to speak of regional integration agreements as another mechanism that might be operationalized uh, just by virtue of more sort of shared understanding and, and a common frame of reference for countries. Um, I'll stop there um, and happy to take this uh, further later. Thanks very much for that super interesting paper. Yes, thank you. That's great. Th thanks for your comments, Lavlin. And, and now I think it's appropriate to leave uh, Anush and, and Amrita, uh, the, the opportunity to, to, to respond, to react. I don't know who wants to go first. Is Anush, do you want to go first? Sure. So maybe on a, on a, maybe not on all the points, but on a, on a few points, uh, in terms of, of definitions, first of all, uh, also, maybe responding to what Amrita said about definitions. Um, I think, you know, it's what we see in the WTO and what we see how members approach these issues of, of defining, you know, gender or gender equality. Um, it's, it's extremely tricky. And so basically what members have done, they've, they've gave up on, you know, coming up with definitions. Because for some countries, gender can mean different things and so from for and these different things mean not just uh, men and women it's just men and women and plus and so for other countries on a cultural level it's something which is not at all acceptable and so you know we started to have these discussions very very early on when 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 members started to 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 you know um, um, talk about these issues and then they decided like you know we're not we're not going to go there because this is this is not uh, you know we're going to 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 fall into uh, into a huge uh, into a huge pit and then we never get out of, of, of it so basically now the the the, uh, the the standard language is we we let's say associate gender equality with women's economic empowerment and of course, you know, again, as you mentioned, lovely, this, this issue of defining women's economic empowerment, uh, you know, what does it mean exactly? So, uh, but, you know, the fact that they are associating gender equality and women's economic empowerment shows that they want to really focus more on, on women. And, and, and that's, the, that's the work that they, 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 they want to focus on. Uh, if you look at the, 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 new, um, the new WTO declaration on, on trade and gender equality, this is, you know, look at the, the, the title, it's, it's absolutely clear, you know, gender equality and women's economic empowerment are associated. So this is something which is a bit tricky, but somehow, but however, I think there are some organizations that um, are uh, going into these definitions, especially you were mentioning uh, women entrepreneurs, how do we define women entrepreneurs? As you say, it can mean a lot of things. It can mean self-employed. It can be very small businesses. It can be really larger. Is it because women uh, own 100% of the business or less than 100%? Um, you know, so we know that some some business women are just the face of the company, and behind it's just the husband who is doing the work. So um, the the ISO actually has uh, uh, at the end of um, was it last year? or before that, um, has uh, come up with, um, with a standard uh, defining women entrepreneurs. So I think that that work was, was quite, uh, quite interesting and it could be very useful 
to, to, to use, especially, you know, we're talking about government procurement, then that's, that's something which, is, which can be extremely, extremely useful uh, for governments to use. Um, so, but then, you know, we see also that uh, governments have already these sort of definitions as part of their policies um, so how do you how do you combine those the already existing definitions? I know that, for example, in India they have very specific um, uh, very specific uh, criteria to define women entrepreneurs and you know how they can benefit from different schemes or government procurements or whatever. And um, you know how do you reconcile this definition, which is already being there and used for so many years? with this new standard that is coming up from an international organization. So reconciling that it can be can be an issue. And then when you talked about the domestic laws and how a national trade policy can also um, have have an impact uh, in, on, uh, on women, I think we've seen um, that I would say at least in the last decades, uh, we've seen WTO members integrating gender into their trade policies. Um, looking at creating better uh, economic opportunities or uh, looking at uh, filling um, uh, a workforce uh, shortages in the export, uh, uh, export oriented uh, sector, or uh, also some of these policies have an impact on the working conditions of, of women, making it a bit, a bit better. If we look at, for example, we had, uh, there is an example in the Philippines when they wanted to favor their uh, one of their export sector, export services sector, and more than half of the employees of that sector were women. And so in the end, uh, in, the, in the country, women were not allowed to work at night. And of course, you know, these are the, the, the sort of call centers uh, sort of, of services. And, uh, you know, because of the, of the time difference, women, were had to work at night. They didn't have any any other choice. So the government had to had to change the law to allow these women to work at night. Of course, you may think this is not a social advantage because working at night is not great. But on the other end, you can see that if you work at night, you are better paid as well. And then, but the government didn't didn't just um, do that. They said, okay, if you uh, companies want to ask to to do this for you then you have to do something for women. So you need to help them, um, you know, uh, have uh, dedicated rooms where they can rest. You need to be able to have uh, special, special, uh, uh, specially nutritious uh, um, uh, or programs to, 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 to feed these women that are working at, at night. You need to provide them with safe transport because we know that for women to have access to to, to, to jobs and economic opportunities, transport is, is extremely uh, important and is a key barrier for women to have to be economically empower, empowered. So you have this kind of almost, I would say, spillover effect of these, these trade policies um, that were focusing on one aspect for women, but in the end, they, they had this, this impact to, to make their, their working conditions better. And this is something which is, I think, quite interesting to, to highlight because um, we see, you know, we always say that, oh, you know, uh, women are more employed uh, in trade sector. You know, the trade sector employ more women. We have tons of figures that say that, but nobody says that, you know, what kind of jobs these women have. And often it's, it's low paid, low skilled, uh, low level kind of jobs that they have. Of course, you know, um, that, that, so this is also something I think that, you know, if these trade policies can also make uh, these changes and these also, which leads to cultural changes actually. So it transforms the society as well. It's not just responding to, to women's needs specifically, but it's also transforming things. And I think, you know, we need to go you were, you were talking about, you know, how do you define this, you know, how about uh, gender responsiveness? Well, I think we need to go even further than just gender responsiveness. We need to be transformative. All these policies need to be transformative. Um, and this is where um, I think uh, these policies, these trade agreements could, could help. But then, of course, we have these, these, these downfalls um, that, uh, that you were highlighting and, and, and Amrita was highlighting. 
um, how can we how can we better how can we do better? I think um, there are different things you mentioned. Uh, for example, that you have these uh, um, initiatives in different uh, regional organizations or international organizations. I think these can help. Um, we've I've seen this in the WTO. I mean, six years ago, this issue of trade and gender was non-existing at all. The WTO was 300% blind to these issues. I mean, <laughs> uh, when, when I first started to work on these issues, uh, people could not understand what I was, what I was, what I was doing. You know, they were like, but this is, this is all bullshit stuff. You know, it's not hardcore stuff. It's not like trade rules. It's like, well, yeah, but you know, if you implement trade rules with gender lens, then it can have, they can have an impact on women too. So uh, six years down the line, we have an in international, we have, sorry, an informal working group on trade and gender in the WTO. We have a, a, new, uh, a new declaration, which is really focusing on, on making things, um, uh, on you know, members taking action, actually. It's not just saying, oh, you know, we're gonna palm, economic empowerment is very important and trade can help. That was the, 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 the former uh, declaration, the Buenos Aires one from 2017. But now it's different, you know, members are saying we want to take action. You know, Amrita was mentioning data collection. It's so important, you know, we don't have the data. When we do the research, you know, we spend months and months looking for data to support some of these arguments. And, um, and it's extremely difficult. So also this is why we are doing these, these uh, data collections ourselves in the end, because you, know, you better certify yourself, right? In the end. <laughs> so, but I think, you know, uh, I think governments are, are really um, opening up to, to, to these ideas. Even some of the members were, which were not be in the beginning uh, super um, supportive of, the, of this issue are now coming around and saying, okay, now we want to work with this group. We want to work with this. Uh, these are these other members to, to, to make things happen. So I think it can have, these kind of initiatives can have an impact at the regional level, at the national level, because of course you have these, um, these experience sharing uh, activities. You may think it's very, it's, it's soft, it's not so important, it doesn't make sense, it doesn't make any difference on the ground. But actually, you know, one government learning from another one then I, I see that you know at some point they decide okay let's cooperate let's talk to each other and then that that can have an impact then when a country can can uh, uh, then design its own trade policies and integrate these issues in, in, uh, in uh, at the national level or even at the regional level so I think we we we, we I mean I see this this evolution in the WTO and um, I see this willingness to have a really uh, impact on the ground. Now, how much can it be done and how long it's going to take, then that's another, that's another discussion. And of course, it's not going to happen, uh, you know, uh, at the end of this year that, you know, everything is going to be wonderful. But I think already we are um, turning this issue from just talking about this, from just saying, okay, we need to understand what is this relation between trade and gender, it's like, what is this animal, uh, to say, okay, we need to act on this. So I think, you know, in just less than six years time, I think that's just, you know, especially in WTO, if you count it in WTO time, <laughs> when we still are negotiating uh, um, issues that were decided back in 2001, <laughs> So I think that's quite, that's quite amazing. And I think it's probably because of the issue itself. I think because the gender issue is so, you know, everybody, every, time, every time I speak with, with some colleagues, they say, oh, but it's so politically sensitive. We cannot go there. We can, no, actually it's not that politically sensitive in the end because members are saying, well, it's, it's about uh, economic growth. It's about development. And uh, it's as practical as that. So, if for developing countries, that's that's the uh, that's the idea. And you see uh, even more commitment from uh, least developed countries. Actually, uh, in Africa, for example, they are 100% on these issues. 
Um, and which often I see people being surprised at this, but I said, no, because this is their economic survival. This is part of their, of their also, this is also part of their, uh, for, for some of them, if you take the, the, the Gambia, for example, it's a matriarchal uh, society. So um, you see that women have had this um, central role in the society already. So this is something that um, I think will, will, um, will be uh, quite interesting to, to watch also from, from the WTO side. And I will stop here and I will let uh, Amrita speak. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anush. Um, you've completely simplified my job. I mean, uh, um, I um, was uh, nodding my head on every single point uh, you presented and, uh, and, and some of these insights uh, that you uh, talked about today, I think we should probably try and weave them into our paper, especially in the policy prescription part uh, as we are revising uh, and preparing the next version, the next draft of it. Um, thank you so much, Lovelyne, uh, for uh, these extremely insightful, uh, very valuable comments. Um, and, 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 and it could not be more timely. Um, and thanks to Luca for organizing this at such a timely hour for us because you know our paper is undergoing revisions, <laughs> uh, painful revisions indeed. <laughs> So, uh, so, so we would um, uh, be benefiting from your comments as they would definitely go a long way as we, as, 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 uh, we uh, work on these revisions. Uh, in particular, um, I think uh, your comments about um, uh, trying to uh, define uh, women entrepreneurs or women businesses, adding this definition and, or committing to a definition, perhaps the ISO definition that uh, was employed, perhaps we can employ that uh, in the paper and sort of limit the scope of uh, at least that expression. Um, and also trying to weave in uh, more of uh, cocoa farming and agricultural aspect of women entrepreneurs uh, in the paper to sort of justify the title um, with the content, with the actual content, in addition to the introduction and conclusion is important. Um, and your excellent point about um, linking the debate, the discussion about digital divide in the first part to um, the recent agreements, such as the UK Australia trade agreement uh, in the second part, because we have um, uh, not mentioned uh, clearly uh, the aspect of how trade agreements can enhance uh, or can reduce digital divide between men and women. Uh, or increase uh, women's participation in e-commerce. Um, and I think that is uh, definitely um, a, a relevant area where uh, various recent trade agreements um, have um, sort of incorporated provisions, re relevant provisions on, uh, including UK, Australia. Um, so these are uh, extremely pertinent points and, uh, and, and well noted and accepted. Um, now, um, one uh, question that you raised uh, was of particular interest to me, which is about um, how do we make these provisions more sustainable? How do we make them crisis proof? Um, well, I, I, I would think that the answer lies in various factors, but perhaps uh, a few things, uh, a few trigger points that come to my mind or actions um, that are most fundamental are uh, first, um, of course, as I previously mentioned, collection of um, sex disaggregated data. I mean, um, whenever we talk about or whenever we are advocating uh, gender mainstreaming in trade agreements or trade policies, one question that we get asked um, is, where is the evidence? How does it work? Does it actually work? Um, do you have any evidence to show in numbers um, how the existing trade agreements that include these beautiful trade, the gender provisions uh, where countries have promised to reduce gender inequality in their respective jurisdictions, increase women's access to education and so on and so forth and create tall mountains of these promises. Have they had any actual impact in their respective jurisdictions in the last, what, 20, 15 years? Because some of these provisions are very old, right? Um, so, so we get asked of evidence uh, every time we talk about or we, we talk about mainstreaming gender and trade policy instruments. Why do we do it? And the answer lies in numbers. We don't have the numbers. We don't have the evidence yet. And the second most important action to make them sustainable and and to make them crisis proof, I would say, 
um, is to change the dialogue. Anoush mentioned this before in her intervention, change the dialogue from these um, issues being a moral good to them be to them having a business sense to it. I mean, multiple studies, reports have now shown to us how um, including women or enhancing gender equality is only going to make the world richer. McKenzie report take, for instance, a McKenzie report, um, and it shows how if we achieve gender equality by 2025, uh, the world economy would get richer by 12 trillion US dollars. I mean, the numbers may not stand, of course, in light of the pandemic we are living, but but of course, there is clearly a business sense argument to this. Um, the other uh, trigger is the creation of political will. Um, it has to be top bottom, top down. I mean, um, political will of countries is fundamental in this respect. And the examples of European Union, Chile, Chile being the first country that negotiated and included a whole standalone chapter on trade and gender in their trade agreement uh, with Uruguay um, uh, in, during the administration of Michel Bachelet um, and the minister and the sub-minister of the Ministry of um, uh, Foreign Affairs uh, were uh, women uh, leaders at that time uh, that were committed to the idea of using trade policy instruments for this purpose. So clearly political will, willingness here is extremely important. Um, and finally, I would say um, limiting, somehow limiting. I understand and completely agree with what Anush is saying, and it is not possible to, especially in today's climate of uncertainty, unpredictability, and lack of trust amongst WTO members. It's absolutely uh, 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 taking a dream to talk about, you know, with. Uh, it's like dreaming if you're talking about coming up with a definition that WTO members can agree together. Um, but somehow it is important to limit the scope of these provisions or these words that we are commonly using in the trade policy instruments to minimize uh, the fears of moral imperialism um, because, because de developing countries do believe that they can be taken for a ride by developed countries um, with the help of these provisions uh, since there is already lack of uh, trust and that has mm, the COVID-19 pandemic has not helped as it has ruptured uh, you know, long line uh, years and decades long trade relationships. Uh, but somehow I think uh, it is important to sort of reduce these fears of moral imperialism. What may be morally right for me, morally acceptable for me may, may completely be morally unacceptable for the other country, right? So, uh, so somehow um, these, to, to, to deal with these fears uh, is extremely important because uh, even though we have front runners like Canada, Chile, European Union, and now UK trying to sort of um, advocate for gender mainstreaming, um, we cannot close, shut our eyes to the fact that most of the countries still remain completely against um, uh, or completely opposed to even um, using gender and trade in the same sentence. So um, here goes the reality and somehow uh, um, we don't have solutions, but um, as Anush said, we have at least uh, we are at least making an effort to identify the problems at this stage. Well, this is absolutely great, you know, mind blowing. Uh, I have a full page here of questions and comments, so I, I will not do that now. I might be sending you an email, maybe uh, after other people here uh, have, have uh, made their questions, I might raise a couple of them. So I, I really uh, open it up now to Anybody here, if they want to uh, to intervene? Oh yes, I can say Zillard is there. Please, Zillard. Hey, thank you very much, ladies, for the presentation. Um, it is a difficult topic, right? Because on the one hand, you don't want to be in a position, let's say, if you are the European Union, where you want to morally impose your values on another country. But then again, how would you then achieve the goal? What I can tell you is because one of my areas of expertise is the European Common Commercial Policy, is that a bit my fear is that the more, let's say, WTO extra or plus areas you add on to trade agreements, whether at the regional or multilateral level, the more difficult it will become to negotiate those agreements. So currently the EU is uh, 
has put on hold its negotiations with Malaysia and Indonesia because of palm oil. Uh, and uh, the European Parliament is very adamant about making sure that there's going to be some provisions in these agreements on palm oil exports. Um, and because it's such a crucial export for Indonesia and Malaysia, they literally just called off the whole thing. And now they actually have uh, two WTO cases as well against the European Union um, on the treatment of palm oil. So a bit my fear is that even though we want to achieve something which should be done, maybe going this way of including chapters in, in trade agreements, which as you said, are very difficult to enforce. Um, and also it will just make everything a bit more difficult to negotiate. So what I've seen, for example, the EU doing is that I think they will have almost a better result by having constant dialogue with the partners in Indonesia and making sure that they understand the Indonesian side and then building it up like that as something more organic instead of saying, this is what we will put in the trade agreement and whether you like it or not, we will be out of the trade agreement because if you don't have the trade agreement that has the clause in it, you have not obtained the goal, what you wanted to achieve. So it, it, is, a, it is a very difficult balancing act. So that, that led me to a different uh, thing I was thinking about. And what about FinTech, right? So we haven't talked about the importance of, uh, of the private sphere. And I know that it's not very popular nowadays to talk about private companies and we think about Jeff Bezos and all these other big multinationals. But I, I'm, I, I think I'm slowly, as I'm aging, I'm, I'm leaning towards the, maybe because I'm frustrated often of how the public domain handles things, I'm more and more interested in what can the private sphere do if there is an incentive? And we have to think of China, right? So one of the reasons why the whole Alibaba fiasco happened was that you also had Ant, and Ant would have been a subsidiary of Alibaba and they would have been able to offer loans to small entrepreneurs who the banks regularly refuse. So I'm thinking, why not somehow have a collaboration with the financial technology sector? Because there would be, I think, plenty of companies would be willing to offer these women loans, even though they don't meet the lending criteria of the bigger banks. Um, and I can just give you an example while we're talking, I'm also, you know, checking my trades here on one of these trading platforms. Uh, it's something I, you know, a little hobby I do on the side. I'm always amazed to see how many women there are, are trading stocks and how many of them come from India, they come from the Philippines, they come from Thailand and, and they share their experience. So I'm thinking, yeah, what, what, can, what, what could either the WTO do or the public sector uh, to, to have some collaboration with the private sector, with the fintech companies. And I understand, of course, the, the reality that not everywhere will that, that will be possible due to the limitations and so on of, of technology. Okay, thanks, Ziller, for your, your comments. Um, any other comment from those present? Yeah, Hanok, please have a go. Thank you so much, uh, Anush and Amirfa. Very interesting paper, and I look forward to uh, reading the paper. Uh, while you, you were describing the, the taxonomy of these uh, gender provisions in trade agreements, and I was thinking about the similarity that we see uh, in other areas as well. This is a typical way sort of trade agreements deal with other non-trade interests. When you look at environmental provisions, it, it's the same kind of taxonomy of provision that you find there as well. And to some extent, I was thinking in other areas, for example, in environment, if you look at the trade and environment discourse in the WTO, you always go to Article 20 of the GATT, and then that's where most of the discussions happens. And you need those kind of provisions because governments in the first place, at least are trying to take environmental measures, the measures are there. So when those measures are there, then there is an issue of inconsistency. So you run to 20 to see that they can be justified or not. In, in the area of gender equality, the measures are not there in the first place, right? So having exceptions in, in trade agreement, how much sense does it make on its own, right, first? Second, 
For example, in the area of environment, again, it makes sense because those measures are often challenged, right? Would, for example, if a government takes, you know, a measure to, a, let's say, discriminatory measures to promote gender equality, would that be challenged? Is there a probability of, you know, legal challenges against those measures so that for these exceptions to make sense in the first place? But even, even if we have those measures, could we say that trade is making any contribution here by providing exceptions, right? Here, trade is just, you know, leaving the, you know, stepping outside, right? Not really doing, taking any positive action to promote sort of gender inequality, right? The measures are taken. So in that sense, what is going to be your sort of policy prescription? How should trade agreement, not trade itself, right? I wonder whether you also make this distinction between trade and then what trade agreements can achieve, right? Uh, there is a huge difference between the two. So in terms of what trade agreements can achieve beyond exceptions, what are the ways in which you know, trade agreements can contribute? I was thinking, for example, if you look at unilateral preferential sort of treatments, there you have sort of sort of human rights conditions and other which demands the beneficiaries to take measures. Whereas reciprocal trade agreements do not have those kind of provisions, right? So what kind of provision do we need in trade agreements to sort of for trade to positively contribute to gender equality and women economic empowerment? Thanks. Thanks, Anok. Um, can I just take my, my, my time here one minute and I will provide you two comments before giving you the final uh, round of the rejoinder, if you wish. As I said, it was mind blowing. And uh, uh, what really, one thing that really uh, struck me is that I did see a lot of commonality with many other mainstream, if you wish, uh, or traditional trade issues. I mean, uh, so uh, in your paper, maybe, I will not uh, play, uh, if you wish, uh, the role of, okay, this is the ugly duckling. This is an area which is uh, a new or it is becoming, it's not uh, as new anymore uh, because definitions, definitions has been a problem in, in trade law for decades, even in mainstream areas. Think about dumping, think about subsidies, think about likeness. So. Uh, it's, it's everywhere, it's difficult, particularly when you have 160 plus members to agree on a common definition. So that is not in my view, it is an issue, but it is not an issue which is specific uh, of trade and gender, which is making it something special, which may uh, put it in, in a shadow if you consider it or portray it as a special. No, it is mainstream. As Anush was, uh, Anush was suggesting, I mean, now climate change in the, in the international uh, policy narrative has become, so it looks uh, mainstream, uh, digitalization of the economy, it is like that. And I'm sure that in a couple of years, few years, maybe the third one will be uh, uh, gender issues. So that would be, in my view, the way to portray it in the paper. Um, another, uh, uh, other examples of, how uh, many of the issues that have been put, uh, explained about trade agreements are not so special of this area. Yes, maybe the language may be hortative only, so shall endeavor, whatever. Uh, maybe there is, they are not enforceable, but even there, there are many chapters, and as, as Zilla was suggesting in many WTO plus area, but not only, uh, that in PTAs are non-enforceable. Think about competition. Think again about subsidies. So again, this is not special of this area. Uh, it is a controversial area. It is a sensitive area. Hence, you understand why you have uh, this uh, uh, lesser degree of enforceability. But again, I would not portray that as the exception. It is really uh, a mainstream, uh, as Anush was suggesting, if you wish business, trade topic. And since it is controversial, it seems to have many of the characteristics in its regulation, which uh, belong to controversial topics. I don't know, this, I'm just thinking aloud, I was thinking aloud about, about that now. 
Another comment I, comment I would like to make, it is fascinating that you have failures uh, in the way of gender uh, uh, equality that are uh, general failures linked, for example, to uh, lack of education or uh, a lack of protection of SMEs. And at the same time, clearly, you have specific failures. So the action should be both general, general policies and specific policies. What would be fascinating really to understand is where the action should be coming from should really be coming from the top or should be coming from the bottom. Uh, I do remember uh, with the comments of the late uh, great uh, Mike uh, uh, Finger, uh, the World Bank formerly, suggesting that in his view, the role of the GATT and the WTO was only a supportive role, but change was, should, was, was about to come and could only come from the domestic level. Uh, again, finally, Sue, when I stop, uh, the issue of data, of knowledge, once again, if you read other areas where in this increasingly common law reform talk, uh, there is uh, a big, big highlighting of the need of knowledge, well, this is common to other areas. So once again, I would try to, to look at other areas of trade law and try to, to strike uh, and to underline the commonalities because that may help in mainstreaming your, your narrative. But I stop here. And again, the, the final word should really be up to you. So I don't know, Anush, whether you want to, to, to say something or Amrita. Um, Amrita, if, if it's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or unless you want to go, okay. <laughs> no, I mean um, these are really fascinating, uh, fascinating comments. And um, uh, one thing about, for example, the the, the private sector. Um, I, I mean, I agree that the private sector can bring uh, a lot uh, to, uh, to 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 this issue. Uh, uh, we we are at the WTO. Um, working on a specific area with the private sector, which is the trade finance aspect. And we've started work um, with uh, various organizations as well as, um, as, well as uh, financial institutions and, and banks. And so that aspect, um, we definitely uh, work with uh, the private sector to, to, to make sure that you know, trade finance is, um, is uh, accessible. And we just recently added a, a gender uh, element to, to, to that work. Um, so we are participating in a, in a study to understand these, uh, these gaps, uh, the, the gender gaps in, in trade finance. Um, working, uh, well, the, 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 the study is, uh, the lead of the study is the IFC, but um, this, is, uh, this, is, this is also involved, you know, they have like, uh, a network of uh, more than of hundreds of, 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 of banks that they work with. And so I think that could be, um, um, that, that's, what, that's one aspect of the work that, that, that we do. Um, I think in terms of, uh, and maybe uh, Abrita, she, she, you're going to kill me if, if I say that, but, <laughs> but I think in terms of, you know, how can we make these, um, these what, you know, we call this uh, cultural imperialism uh, go away. Um, I really believe that uh, the collaboration aspect of these trade agreements can help with, with that. You know, it's just it's a very soft way of understanding each other. It's a very soft way of understanding where you stand on on these gender issues. Um, it's about collaboration. It's about sharing um, information, experience. Uh, this is what we've seen in WTO as well uh, in the first few years. Of, uh, of looking at this issue, members were mostly focusing on experience sharing. Uh, of course, me, uh, I'm, you know, as an expert at some point, I said, I'm fed up of this experience sharing, I want action. So, <laughs> but, you know, in the end, if you look at, you know, if, if you look at your, your question about, you know, how can we prevent this, uh, this maybe these, these, these provisions uh, can be uh, an answer to, 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 to imposing one one's uh, culture to 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 another one it's just like you know making it helps these governments talk to each other um so 
that's that's maybe one one, one thing. Um, also, um, another thing which I wanted to highlight is um, about this mainstreaming thing issue. Um, I think uh, we always say that gender is a cross-cutting issue. So it, it, it's you know it has uh, you know if you look from the environment, from employment issues, from from uh, you know uh, trade issues, you always have a gender element to 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 to, to these issues. But then you know I think these um, these these areas, they often work in silos. If you took the example of, um, of, uh, of climate change, for example, and how uh, over the last decades, um, organizations, governments, uh, private sector have been integrating um, gender uh, issues in, for example, when they design responses to be uh, to climate change um, hazards, for example, or when they design programs, they include more women in decision making, for example. Um, so I think you know we can learn from this process. The, the trade people can learn from this process, um, and we don't do that enough. And I think COVID nineteen has shown us this. Um, it has shown us that actually, this pandemic is is, an, is, is another. Um, I would say maybe a natural disaster. And so how, what can we learn from how, um, you know, what can we learn from um, how we deal with natural disasters or the impact of, uh, of natural disasters and how they impact women? Uh, if we compare with COVID-19, it's almost the same thing. So why, why can't we just take the solutions that were already designed uh, and already fall through and adapt them to the current situations, to the current crisis. So I think this is really, for me, the way to mainstream uh, things. And 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 um, this is this is uh, you know learning from from all these different areas of work. It's very important. And um, I'm all, always you know when I talk about these issues, you know, you we mentioning education is quite key or. Uh, <laughs> Everybody is, is always saying, saying to me, but I know it's not a trade issue. Well, actually, they are trade issues because if you talk about, you know, if women don't have access to finance, they cannot trade because trade is costly. Um, if they are not educated, uh, they cannot trade because trade is very education in, in, in intensive. So it's just there is always these links that can be done that we don't do enough because we always look at our areas in very vertically, not horizontally, although we always say that gender is a cross-cutting issue. So I think this is something that we need to, to, um, to, to think about. And just one last point on the, the, top to but, the top or bottom approach. I think, um, I think both, I think definitely both because um, I learned so much going uh, and see uh, and meet with these women entrepreneurs. Um, I've learned so much uh, going to see their environment, talking to their families, talking to their workers, uh, going and see their, the, where, they, where they work, how they work, in which conditions. And um, I think that, you know, learning from that is very important. And I think, um, you know, the idea is to maybe bring that the reality of the ground back to the to 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 the top, back to the to, to those governments, back to these organizations. That you know you can do so much research and you know and and then have your name on a on a nice paper, but then what's the impact of of, the, of that research? And this is why we we are um, you know uh, I have created this uh, this uh, gender research hub. Um, uh, recently, last year, uh, Amrita is part of that uh, of that hub, and it's it's a network of of trade and gender experts, trade and gender researchers, that you know, with the idea of okay, we need to understand from different areas what what is you know what is being what is being thought about, what is being researched about, and then bring that 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 research and uh, associate it with the reality of the ground. And see how we can use this to uh, support governments to design these these policies um, at the domestic level or the regional level. So um, I think that the, the 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 bottom aspect is is so crucially important. And often it's it's not very much um, 
I would say, not very much um, uh, valued often. Um, and the, 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 the top approach, I mean, you, you can see it, um, I would say, in the, in the, in the WTO, um, where you have um, these discussions that can have, that can also influence uh, negotiations. I mean, we've seen last year that there was these, um, the, the, uh, the, the, the negotiations, the plur plurilateral negotiations on uh, domestic regulations of, of services was, was, uh, was fi finalized and they adopted this, uh, this, uh, these, these new rules. And then this is the first time in the history of the WTO that you have a gender equality provision in a, in a, in a document, in a text, in, a, in, in rules, in WTO rules that were negotiated. So I think this is not just by chance. I think this is also uh, an influence of the, the, the current discussions that members have been having. And so that brought other, other, other members, other governments to, to join uh, this, uh, this, new, this new initiative. And so that has, of course, um, uh, snowball effects uh, um, elsewhere uh, and going you know, from the top to, to the bottom. So I think definitely um, both would be, uh, would, would, are, are absolutely, uh, absolutely crucial, but they don't really meet, that's the problem. And maybe that's the role that you know, we could have, um, or you know, that's, the, that's how I see also uh, my role is to, to make those two meet. Thank you, Anush. Um, Rita, you want to say anything? Sure, thank you. Um, so right, yeah, the new JSI on domestic regulation of services, we can no longer call WTO rulebook gender blind, can we? <laughs> um, uh, really quickly, I wanted to sort of um, uh, touch upon two or three different um, um, uh, questions, uh, issues here. Uh, first about, um, I think it was, uh, about um, adding such gender provisions as to whether and uh, would these would adding these gender provisions uh, to trade agreements uh, not make trade negotiations more complicated or more difficult uh, was probably one of the first questions um, and and the balancing act even more complicated um, uh, it would certainly um, and it did make um, the trade negotiation process of USMCA between US, Canada and Mexico extremely complicated because US imposed uh, a very high standard, a huge, uh, very ambitious bar on labor standards on Mexico, um, which would have short as well as long-term repercussions on the automobile uh, industry and reduce the comparative advantage of this country in this automobile sector. Um, so yes, it added um, a lot to the complexity of the negotiations, but the negotiations did go ahead and it led to a trade agreement for the benefit of, for the long-term benefit of trade uh, um, workers and laborers in, in, in Mexico, which is a developing country. And, uh, and the hourly wage rate was somewhere around $2 in this industry as compared to 19 and 21 in US and Canada. Um, so it, it certainly uh, sort of uh, leads to a fair outcome. Um, and it would have uh, been difficult perhaps to negotiate um, many exceptions such as public morality exception with no definition whatsoever uh, back then in those those golden era days um, but then again i mean every single wto member has agreed to um, comply with a with an exception and to accept an exception that has allowed countries to protect animal health and life dolphins a tuna, shrimp, sea water, well, sea, uh, sea turtles, um, and, um, and, and, and plant life and health and so on and so forth. And the list goes on. So I think, I think it's a matter uh, of time for us to see when gender issues would start to fall under Article 20A, because, uh, and that's again a matter Anush and I uh, always discuss and uh, disagree upon. Um, but um, gender equality um, uh, is a public morality concern. 
uh, if we can uh, invoke this exception to protect dolphins, we can invoke this exception to protect women's economic interests. We can we can invoke this exception to protect women's physical uh, protection or physical interests. Um, so um, we really have two options here. Either um, uh, we need to sort of assess and explore whether um, it is possible to invoke Article 20A for the protection of gender equality interest. Um, there are arguments for and against, uh, of course, clearly. Um, but if the arguments against uh, the invocation of 20A um, uh, win the game, uh, then um, whether we can come up with a specific gender exception um, uh, for the future trade agreements, and that links with the other questions that Henault for example, raised, um, is an exception, a particular gender exception in trade agreements viable? Um, now, um, I would say uh, it is not viable at least until the stage uh, where uh, countries come together and accept um, a definition, limit the scope of gender itself. Um, does gender only incl include the interest of women uh, and the roles of women and men? What about transgender communities? Um, do we have anything in trade agreements and trade policies uh, about transgender communities? I mean, when we talk about gender as a whole, of course, we are talking about uh, uh, many other marginalized actors in addition to men and women. Um, and have trade agreements gone beyond these exceptions? Yes. Um, we have had inclusions of gender prov provisions and promises in preambles and objectives. And uh, well, uh, adding a simple uh, gender equality commitment in the agreement's general objectives clause or the principles clause. I mean, it, 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 it is not a concrete commitment where parties say we are going to enhance women's access to financial instruments, but it throws light upon how the entire agreement is interpreted, right? Um, and, and, and that's why it is valuable. And then we have other examples and other ways of including uh, these commitments and trade agreements beyond exceptions, reaffirmations. Member ha members have included reaffirmations where they say we reaffirm our commitments under ILO conventions relating to gender equality and labor standards affecting women as employees and so on and so forth. And finally, I would just like to touch upon uh, the last question that Luca raised, uh, um, looking at other areas of trade law and identifying commonalities is an excellent idea. Um, that I think we definitely need to sort of um, uh, explore and uh, and pull upon further. Uh, one um, uh, attempt that I have made in this respect, uh, Luca, has been a chapter um, uh, that I recently did uh, with Marcus. He is a trade negotiator of trade and labor issues at the European uh, Commission, um, where we have tried to um, explore uh, the relationship between labor and gender provisions in trade agreements. Um, and there are various commonalities as you rightly pointed out. I mean, labor was staunchly opposed as a topic back then in the days at the WTO forums and even at the bilateral trade forums. They did not even want to hear the word labor. And now we have these USMCA agreements and alike with such huge and highly enforceable with rapid dispute settlement mechanism, right? That we haven't seen in any other trade agreement, um, ready to put these provisions into action, into implementation within 30 days, 60 days time limit. My God, the times have changed. And, 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 and the other commonality of course is um, uh, other than um, enforcement, um, that both these concerns or issues, labor and gender are non-trade issues. I mean, they were considered as social issues at one point in time. And now there is the greater acceptance of labor vis-a-vis -vis gender. We still don't have that level or that extent of acceptance for gender provisions that we have already seen in, for labor standards in the existing, especially in the recent agreements. Why? Perhaps because labor standards are more trade germane, perhaps because scholars and scholarship has shown how labor standards are directly related to economic interests of these countries, and that has not been done for gender issues so far. So I think the link, going back to Anusha's point, um, the link needs to be tightened between gender and trade. Thanks very much. This is great. I think we we have we cannot really 
uh, abuse of our speakers more of their time. Uh, it has been a fascinating session. So I, I really want to thank uh, Anoush, uh, Amrita, our speakers, Lovelin for uh, acting as discussants and also the participants for, for their comments. And the final thing I would like to say is that this is being recorded. So uh, I'm sure that uh, many other people will benefit from, from this by viewing it into the future. And then uh, a little mean point, next month there will be uh, another talk where Hanok that is present here will present uh, one of his papers on renewable energy subsidies. So uh, thanks very much again to everybody and stay tuned. <laughs>